I'm Sean Rainey. I work in planning and institutional research for anyone that doesn't know me. And with me here today is Mike Hales. He is the co-interim chief administrative officer and also our chief financial officer here within the institution. You're better than I do. Uh, thank you. <laughs> if you look on the agenda, this says a situational level setting. And what we wanted to try to do was talk collectively about some of the parameters that NKU is operating under in regards to state performance funding, our own internal incentivized budget model, and then also one of the key drivers of both of those models, and that's our student enrollment, and show you the interconnections between all of those factors. Um, we thought it would be beneficial to have this conversation simply because as we're talking about the launch of the strategic process, as we're hearing from some of our key stakeholder groups, we thought that it would be important in a good context or backdrop to those conversations. I'm not going to be expected to stand when you present, are you? What's that? I'm not going to be expected to stand when you present, am I? You, can, you feel free to sit down if you want to. Oh, okay. Uh, what we want to try to cover today was at a very high level, talk to you about some of the CPE performance funding metrics. Uh, trying to talk a little bit about the integration with our own internal incentivized budget model. There was some deliberate overlap and connection between those. We want to try to make sure everyone understands what that looks like and how that looks. Uh, we're then going to talk a little bit about NKU's performance, specifically across some enrollment populations so we can see the connection and how those are supposed to scaffold up and reinforce each other. Um, for some people, this isn't going to be uh, anything new. They've probably seen this information in some format or version before, so this can serve as a refresher. Uh, for those that haven't seen it before, this may be an introduction to those topics, but we thought it would be helpful. Um, we also are going to try to show a little bit of how NKU's performance looks relative to some of the other institutions across these performance funding metrics. Some of them are atypical and not things that you would see in IPEDS or some other national data sets. And so we want to kind of walk through and explain what those are. And again, the goal was just to build a shared understanding. Here's where we are as an institution. Here are some models that we are working with. Here's how our enrollment feeds into those models. Uh, we think that that will be a good contextual shared understanding as we start talking about the strategic framework process. Okay. This is how state appropriations are spread across the public institutions here. These are the different categories of state performance funding outcomes. And so when we look at those, you can see that 35% of those metrics are allocated to what they call student success. Let me just say that this presentation will be publicly available. So if you're having a hard time seeing it now, uh, if it looks small, it is going to be shared afterwards. And so you have an opportunity to download it and look at it again. So 35% of the state allocations that the state sends out are dedicated to what they call student success. And that's really looking at degrees conferred with some special emphasis on STEM plus H degrees, uh, underrepresented minority degrees, low income. But then they've also developed something else. Now, degrees conferred is really a summative metric. How many students cross the finish line? How many students exit the institution with a degree in hand? What they've also tried to develop is some kind of formative assessment along the way. And so that's what they're calling the progression metrics. And those are looking at the number of students that cross the 30, 60, or 90 hour thresholds within roughly an academic year. And so how many students advance from freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior, junior to senior, just as a way of demonstrating that students are matriculating through their degree programs while they're enrolled at the institution. That is different. You are not going to see that in IPEDS. That's not anything we report anywhere else. And so it's hard to do peer comparisons, except for how we look uh, relative to the other institutions here within the state. Um, next, you see, and now there are a number of metrics that are within student success, and I'll walk you through the next slide, what those metrics are, what the proportionality is of how that breaks out. Credit hours completed, that is a single metric that accounts for 35% of the state allocations. Um, it is looking at earned credit hours, now with some special weights given to graduate hours count more than undergraduate hours, certain disciplines count more than other disciplines, uh, and then there's a special emphasis on in-state students. In-state students, uh, their earned credit hours count twice as much as our out-of-state student populations. Uh, and then there's another 30% that's allocated towards operational expenses, FTE counts, instructional supports, uh, square footage as well. Um, in order, the way that the state looks at these is it's not any single year performance. They use a rolling three-year average to try to offset any kind of drastic changes or performance that an institution may have. And so they use a rolling three-year average. They work with our institutional research department to validate those metrics. They then work with Mike's areas to validate the distribution of how those state allocations should happen. So this is an example of the student success metric. And so unfortunately, it's hard to see. But we talked about this as 35% of the state allocation pie. If you look at the very bottom, you can see 35% equates to almost $182 million. 
you can then see what the weights are for each of those outcomes that are within that proportion of student success. And so if we look at bachelor's degrees, that's 9% of all of the state allocations, which was roughly uh, a little under $47 million. Now the way that that metric works is they use that rolling three-year average. They look at the total state's outcomes, and then they look at what proportion of that outcome does NKU contribute to. And so if, for example, NKU contributed to about 10% of the degrees conferred in that rolling three-year average, we would get about 10% of those state allocations, or a little under $4.7 million. Uh, you can also see how much proportions are allotted to the other metrics, and so you can see that the 30, 60, and 90 hours, that's about 15% of all state allocations are connected to performance within those metrics. Now, if we look at degrees earned, that's about 20% of all state allocations. If we look at bachelor's degrees, the STEM plus H, the URM, the low income. Um, next, Mike was gonna talk a little bit about the interconnection between our perform the state's performance funding model and our own internal incentive-based model. Okay, so as Sean mentioned, um, we have these uh, state funding, uh, performance funding model, but we wanted to also look at how does our own NKU uh, budget model, which we've, we've recently rolled out, how, how does that relate to um, the, uh, the state model? Hopefully we would expect that uh, there is a lot of correlation and, and what I wanna show is that, it, that there is. So this, this shows uh, pretty much what, what Sean just walked through. Uh, we do have 35% uh, that's applied to the, uh, to the student success um, piece of that, which is bachelor's degrees, um, the, uh, the various kickers that we have, uh, the STEM, the URM, and, and the low income, um, and, then, and then the progression, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then we've got 35% that is for the course completion, the earned credit hours that Sean mentioned, and then the, the final areas are really related around the size of the institution. Uh, the FTE students, uh, the instructional and student support expenses and the square footage. So on the right side of the slide, I want to show these are the variables that we use in our internal uh, model. So again, you can see the, the bachelor's degrees, um, and we also have the master's degrees and doctor and the earned, uh, earned, in, excuse me, earned credit hours and attempted credit hours. These colors show where um, the alignment shows up. So you can see a direct alignment here. We have bachelor's degrees um, within the uh, criteria. The state has bachelor's degrees in their criteria. The other direct correlation is um, we have earned uh, credit hours uh, that, that provide part of the uh, incentivization. Uh, the state has the earned credit hours. So where we're a little bit different, the state does not provide uh, direct um, um, master's and doctor degrees, but it does come into play because the attempted credit hours um, that we have, which go directly into the FTE uh, students. Um, so we do have, by providing that um, incentive, we do have uh, an alignment with, with the state model. The other way that we have the incentive here is in the earned credit hours, those uh, hours that are, that are utilized in the, in the um, graduate degrees actually have um, a higher weighting. So by having an incentive for our model to have the, uh, the graduate degrees, um, it, it does uh, provide uh, the additional in incentives um, for that. And I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Sean. Now, this is probably a slide that many of you have seen before. This is looking at our overall enrollment over the last eight years, broken out by student group, undergraduate, graduate, our law students. Uh, you can see the decline that we've had over the last eight years. It's about 8%. Um, you can see we started having some of our, most, our largest declines around 2012, 2013. Um, there were a couple of things that were happening about then. We were starting to enforce some slightly, um, uh, some higher admission standards. We were also starting to see a small shift in our regional demographic in that we were, had fewer high school graduates uh, within our main feeder areas. And we were also starting to see increased competition within our market at that same time. Now, if you look at our most recent completed fall, um, that's the fall 2016 to fall 2017, you can see that we declined between those two falls by 0.5%. Uh, that was our smallest annual decline over the last five years. And so we felt as though we were starting to turn or you know, stem the tide of loss um, 
The reason that this population is important is because it's feeding a couple of those performance funding metrics. When we look at total FTEs, which account for 10% of the state allocations, that's based on this population. Um, after we remove the high school students. They don't allow us to count our school-based scholars or our duly enrolled students. These students are also accounting for that 35% that's within the earned credit hours. Um, if you look at attempted credit hours across the institution, uh, you see that somewhere around 87, 89% of the attempted credit hours of our students actually are earned credit hours. And so we're relatively efficient in how students are earning the credit hours they're attempting. And so the earned credit hours is really being driven by student enrollments. And so as our enrollments have declined, so also have our earned credit hours, especially those weighted averages have also declined. And so about 45% of our state allocations are related to this overall population. Now, one of the other, our largest proportion of our students are our undergraduate student population. And so if you look at this, this is showing our undergraduate student population. We've tried to highlight in gray at the top, the school-based scholar population. Those are our duly enrolled, the high school students that are taking courses for college credit, sometimes on our campus, but often in their own high school, sometimes with our faculty, often with their own uh, high school faculty. And what you can see is that uh, the school-based scholar population has increased dramatically over the last eight years. It's increased over 120%. Um, just from fall 16 to fall 17, it was uh, more than 25% growth within that population. Um, and so if we look at total undergraduates, we see that the decline over the last eight years has been about 7%. However, the school-based scholar students don't count in our metrics when we're talking with CPE. And so if we remove that student population and we recalculate what that loss has been over this time frame, you can see it's been more than 13%. And so over the same time frame, this is what we might consider our base population for that 35% of the metrics around student success. These, this is the base population for degrees earned. This is the base population for those progression metrics of who's advancing and matriculating through their degree program. And so we've seen some relatively substantial losses within this population over this time frame. Um, and so again, we wanted to share this as we're thinking about where are the things that, what are the areas of focus, uh, what are the constraints that we're working under currently within these two different budgeting models and how do we think innovatively towards the future. We thought it would be helpful to kind of share this information, just kind of level set, so everyone had a shared understanding of what we're facing currently. What I want to talk a little bit about next was this yearly progression, that 30, 60, and 90 hours. And we talked about how that is an atypical metric. It's not something that you're going to see somewhere else. It's really a formative measure about how are students advancing through your degree programs. Uh, and the state wanted to start allocating dollars towards this. Now, all of the performance funding metrics are volume based. And so it is just raw numbers. And so if we look at our student population, how many freshmen were advancing from freshman to sophomore status within an academic year? And if we looked at that historically, you can see that that's an area of limited growth, maybe even some decline within that overall number. We find something similar when we look from sophomore to junior and from junior to senior. That doesn't help us when we're looking at the overall CPE budget model. Now, what we have done is we've been more efficient in serving the students that are here. These are the students that have crossed these thresholds. And so those are the students that successfully completed the metric. They're part of some base. And so if we look at what's the proportion of students that have been successful, what we see is that we've actually been more efficient in helping these students move past these 30, 60, and 90 hour thresholds. We just have fewer students to help do that. And so that begins to impact us when we're looking at some of these outcome-based performance funding metrics. This is looking at our undergraduate degrees. And again, that's 20% of the overall model. Um, specifically at the black line at the top, that's overall bachelor's degrees conferred. Next, we're looking at the low income bachelor's degrees, um, the STEM plus H and the URM. These are not mutually exclusive. And so a student can fall within multiple buckets and count in multiple ways uh, and help us in multiple ways when we're looking at this overall model. Now, when you look at this metric, you can see we have been improving. We have been conferring more degrees. We've been having more low-income students or URM students earn these degrees. Now, what we need to remember is that we've been doing this at the same time we've seen declining enrollments. And so at some point, uh, we anticipate that those declining enrollments may begin to impact us. We've been more effective and efficient in moving the students that are here, helping them exit um, with a degree or a credential conferred, uh, but that we can start to see diminishing returns on these if we don't have an influx of additional students. Um, things like transfers or students coming in. New students that we bring in, it will take them time to work through the pipeline and become a, a degree earner. Um, students that come in with credit hours already, 
things like transfers, that can help us in this metric because they can enter and exit with a degree conferred uh, much more uh, quickly. Next, I believe Mike was going to talk to a little bit about our performance relative to some of the other public institutions here in the state. So yeah, we just wanted to show <clears throat> a couple of examples of how at the state level uh, that, that these components work. As Sean mentioned, the state uses a three-year average, and so we're showing a comparison here of uh, fiscal 18, th three-year average, and how that uh, changed uh, with fiscal 19. So this one is the uh, URM bachelor's degrees. And uh, on this component, you can see all the other institutions uh, that in essence we're competing against and how they did compared to how we did. Um, keep in mind though that the way the state looks at it, it doesn't necessarily matter that we improve on a particular category. You can see on here, um, here are, are the ones that uh, improved above the sector average. If you look down at the bottom, the sector average went up 8%. Unless any of these institutions went above that 8%, they did not gain in this component. So a good example is um, UofL. They actually had the second highest volume increase in this category at 46 um, for the fiscal 18, or fiscal 19 over the fiscal 18. And yet they don't benefit um, in this category because they did not, their, their percentage increase was 7.7%. That was not above the sector average. In this case, we were above the sector average at 10.9%. So we did gain um, in this category. Now we'll look at another example, and this is one where we're in kind of a similar situation to what Louisville was, um, in that we actually improved, um, and, and this one's the STEM plus H uh, bachelor's degrees, we actually improved. We went up 45 um, from 636 to 681. Sounds good. Uh, but the sector average was 7.5%, and you can see the ones uh, that actually increased above the sector average. We did not, and so we did not benefit, or, or gain, I should say, um, in, in, this, in this sector. This is a slide that uh, the CPE, um, uh, they did a presentation before one of the committees down in Frankfurt, and they were showing, and this is for, again, the fiscal 19, this is a comparison, hopefully you can kind of see, uh, it's kind of small, but it shows across all of the different categories um, which institutions gained at a higher rate than the sector average. Um, so you can see on ours, we only gained in two um, of, of those categ categories, even though we actually improved in five of the categories, but only two of those were above the sector average. Um, and the reason we really want to in, in, enforce this and talk about um, the importance of, of this is the fact that if you look at where we went from fiscal 18 to fiscal 19 by only improving in, in those two sectors, we ended up leaving about a million dollars on the table. We ended up getting, um, you know, obviously a high, we got about $4.8 million of the uh, distribution um, for, for, the, uh, for the state. Um, but we left about a million dollars on the table by, by not gaining in, in more of the sectors. So it's obviously very important um, how we view these and how we look at um, what, you know, like, like Ashish said, uh, the execution is what it's all about. We need to be executing on, on these and, and um, you know, making sure that we know where, the, where our improvement needs to come from. So one question. Uh, as far as how, how do you win in this, you know, in the state's uh, performance funding model? And just want to walk through a few, uh, some of these are going to seem pretty, pretty obvious, but it's all about enrollments um, when it comes down to it. You have got to enroll and retain a greater number of academically qualified um, degree-seeking students. You've got to encourage the students to take the full course loads and provide support services to help them progress uh, to, to timely completion. We've got to increase the graduation rates and produce more degrees, um, especially those among the areas where there are the kickers, the under, um, underserved population areas. And then finally, and you can't see this one, but it says beat the sector average. Again, it's one thing to improve in all of these different categories. We have to improve at a rate that is higher than uh, the other institutions in, in the state. So with that, we'll, um, I think we've got 
we've got a, a little bit of time to, uh, to take some, some questions. Not everybody at once. Sarah. Hi, can you just talk a little bit about this last slide? Sorry. About this last slide with how to win mm -hmm. versus the discussion that we've been having about being innovative and adding certificates. How are we marrying those two ideas? Well, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I believe that the way we look at this is, in quote, winning on, on these. Everything that is up on, on this slide relates to student success. And by succeeding and by doing those innovation things, um, you know, that's, that's exactly what we are expecting, is that if we're doing what we should be doing, it's going to be, um, you know, having more students want to come here, having more students succeed and get through, um, hopefully in four years, and, and move on. But we're also gonna be addressing the things that the region needs. And by addressing the things the region needs, again, we're gonna be providing more and more. So, you know, that is the good part, I think, of both our internal model and the state model, is that if we are doing what we need to, to do to be successful, we should be, uh, you know, doing the things that, that they've identified in, in this. And not, a, not all of them, or, Sue, did you wanna say something? And the earned credit hours count towards the metrics. And the yeah. FTEs as well. Yeah, and, and by no means would I ever say that, that the state model, I mean, there's plenty of flaws with, with that. One of the things that, you know, that we've talked about is, you know, we're, we're competing directly against the research institutions, UK and U of L, who have, you know, obviously considerably more resources to, to put at things. Not sure that was, you know, and again, there, there, there was a lot of things in these models that we were pushing for that we didn't get. But overall, you know, I, I think it's better that we have a model than not have a model. Other questions? Oh, sorry, Frank. I'd be curious to know um, were there certain areas that we were, you know, it's a little, thanks. Um, it'd be a little bit deeper of a dive to see this, but, you know, 30 hours, 60 hours, 90 hours, were there certain metrics that we've seen any changes or dips or, or, or adjustments on particularly? Yeah, we, we ended up, and, and we did actually, we had a meeting a few weeks ago with, with the deans where we went through some more details of this that literally showed line by line what our percentages went from. And, and you could see, like I said, of all of these, we actually improved on five mm -hmm. um, of, of the the, the measures, but we just didn't improve to the level of the sector, the sector and, and to exceed to exceed that. But, and I don't remember, Sean, if, uh, the, the specific ones. I, I know the ones that really hurt hurt us were the, the um, earned credit hours. We went from, and I forget the exact, probably got it. We went from um, like seven, uh, the student credit hours earned, we went from, um, in fiscal 18, we had about 9.3% of the share and we dropped down to about 9.1. Now that was one where we actually did decline um, and that was not one we improved. We actually declined and the sector average had gone, had gone up. But that one has a, a large percentage of the share going into it. So yeah, there's, you know, and like I said, this just kind of summarizes that we've got all the details um, on that and certainly can share with, with anybody that would want to see, would want to see that. That, that just may help us, I think, too, from an advising standpoint on, you know, are there certain, you know, populations we can, you know, think about in terms of strategy, programming, implementation, that, ideas. Yep, absolutely. And that's why if, if we don't utilize the data that we have, shame on us. I mean, we, we've got to um, look at where we need to in, improve right. and, and um, really focus on what are the strategies, the specific strategies to to get to those. When we look at those freshmen on that 30 hour metric, that's actually one where we've seen the most growth in even though the percentage is not part of that CP metric, that's one of those where we've seen the most growth. And so we've been more effective in serving those students to get them to cross 30 hours. It's just at some point we start to become constrained uh, by the, the enrollment size that we have in terms of that base. And so not that we can't continue to make improvements, but um, 
again, this will be publicly shared, and so you'll be able to look at that, and if you have additional questions, happy to sit down and show you what some of those look like specifically. Thank you. Other questions? Because if there are questions we can keep. Let me, let me just make a couple of observations. Obviously, this is all very new to me as well. And I um, shared with some folks, I went to the, the CPE meeting, president's meeting, a uh, little while ago, and, and they had a full-blown presentation about this. And, and I was very relieved to find that I was not the only president who didn't quite know what the model was doing. So, uh, and some of them have been around for a little bit. But so that was, that was good. But I, I, uh, there are a couple of takeaways that I want to share with you uh, from, from my way of thinking. Um, you, you know, that I think there's a recognition. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a presentation in front of the, um, Adam's not here right now, he might have gone, but there was a, a, a committee, the Higher Education Committee, and we had um, the president of University of Kentucky and the president of Moorhead State that provided a perspective on the performance funding model. Uh, you don't see the numbers up here, but the institution that is, the two institutions that, um, did not benefit from this model were Kentucky State and Moorhead. Uh, but this is the year in which uh, there's, there is what's known as the hold harmless clause. And so no money was taken away from them. Uh, but going forward, if they don't improve on their metrics, and Kentucky State has a different, slightly different approach uh, going uh, for, their, for their performance money, that they could lose money. And so not surprisingly, the president of Moorhead State made a big argument about why the we should rethink this, uh, uh, this model itself. Um, I still, I'm new to Kentucky politics, but I, can, I think one of the th <laughs> some people are saying, <laughs> um, I don't think this, the performance-based funding model is gonna go away. I think it, it, we, we, are, we, are, we have to live with it uh, in some form or the other. In about a, a little over a year from now, perhaps 18 months or so from now, they will reconvene the Council of Presidents that will work with the CPE leadership on looking at the model again and making sure that, because as it turned out, five out of the six presidents who were present were not there when this model was, was uh, agreed to. There are, there are five new faces around the table. And, and our, uh, you know, for instance, I'm gonna want to have a conversation with all of you about what is working, what's not working, so that when I go back there, we can talk about that. So in about 18 months or so, maybe, uh, we will revisit this model to see if there is any adjustments or changes. Um, and then we can make the argument whether in fact having you know, Kentucky and Louisville in the same part, if you will. The second uh, aspect of this is that this model is predicated on, on extra funding. It doesn't work when you're having budget cuts. I mean, that's the reality of it. You're not, <laughs> you're not really, and so this was a pretty obvious thing. And so, Certainly the legislature understands that, I hope, um, and they will keep hearing it from all of us that, y yes, you can tie performance funding, but if, if, there is, if you are, by the same token, reducing allocations, this is counterproductive to, to, to operations. Um, I'm not quite certain it captures sort of base operational needs, and this is somewhat maybe our fault too, that we haven't explained what it takes to produce a baccalaureate student, and we have some work to do on that front. But on a fundamental level, um, I think it's important for all of us to know what drives the performance funding model, and some of the recent dips are not gonna help us when the next iteration comes about. So we, we do have to be a little sensitive to what that might be the case. But there are some good news elements here, um, certainly in terms of the number of bachelor's degrees. Now somebody pointed out that it doesn't take into account our, our production of, of certificates and so on and so forth. So, you know, we, we're gonna have to think about how we want to integrate those in the process. But it does reward us for the number of baccalaureate degrees produced, and then it's cumulative. If we produce a baccalaureate degree a student, then we, and the next one up is if, it's a, if the student happens to be a STEM uh, H student, if it's also a student who is URM, and if it's also a student who's low income, then all those things add up. And so we have a tremendous incentive here to continue to recruit, retain, and graduate that population that has been underserved by higher education in general into, into that. Uh, so there is some alignment. And I think what I would say is, let's look for where the alignment makes sense and, and, and keep, keep that focus going um, and not, you know, not worry too much about some of the spillover challenges 
because my first reaction is, how would you, why would you put the two, um, you know, Kentucky and Louisville as part of the same part in, in allocation? There are two very different approaches, and um, I haven't yet received a satisfactory response, but there's some time to, to, to uncover some of those uh, discussions. So, um, again, I th thank you again for providing that broad input, and we'll certainly make this more broadly available. Um, the CP has, uh, uh, has uh, 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 you know, said that they'd be happy to come here and, um, and, and uh, engage in a conversation with the campus, and if we feel that's something we'd, we'd want to do, we can certainly invite them. Uh, but on that note, um, we want to turn it over to our student panel. They're all here. Dan, you want to kick things off? And I know Hannah is going to do something, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Okay, I'm going to quickly get out of the way here. Our next session is entitled NKU Through the Eyes of Our Students. Uh, regarding the purpose, this session includes many staff, faculty, administrators, and guests who are committed to student engagement, retention, and your success. We hope to better understand your hopes, aspirations, and expectations of NKU. We've asked the panelists to be honest, transparent, and, and tell us what their experiences were, regardless of whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. So hopefully they feel empowered to do so today, and I know we'll learn a great deal from them today. Our moderator is going to be Hannah. Hannah's extremely involved in, in uh, co-curricular experiences here at the institution, serves as the vice president of her sorority, has been a university orientation leader, is in the honors program, is working on two bachelor's degrees, and uh, she's also the student body president who also by position serves on our Board of Regents. So I'm gonna hand this over to Hannah and she will moderate this session. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know we're the session standing between lunch, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I would like everyone on the panel to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background, including what attracted you to NKU and what or who had the greatest influence on your college choice. So if we want to get started, we can just start down the row. Start, you know, start down Hi, everyone. My name is Keisha Frazier. Um, I am from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I graduated um, from NKU for undergrad in 2016, and now I am finishing my last year at Chase Law School here at NKU. Uh, what was the next one? Um, I decided to go to um, NKU um, because if I received a phone call from the political science and the pre-law department here, um, that's what my um, undergrad um, education was in. And so um, I remember speaking to um, a professor, Bruce McClure, and he kind of told me about the pre-law program as well as the law school and that he had graduated from here years ago. Um, so that kind of influenced my decision with coming to NKU. Um, good morning, my name is Trey Underwood. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. I am a junior here at Northern Kentucky University. I'm aspiring to get my bachelor's degree in history with a double minor in pre-law and English. Um, the main thing that attracted me to NKU was uh, just how home-oriented it was for me. I come from a very small family, so, uh, you know, having people who are close to me is very important and everything. Um, that I just really enjoyed about NKU when I came on my visit. And then, excuse me too, I'm, I'm battling my allergies right now, so congestion's really bad. Um, <clears throat> and then the greatest influence uh, for me picking Northern Kentucky University was actually Ms. Rochelle Shields. Um, I applied for the Educational Diversity Scholarship as a senior um, in high school, and she was the first person who welcomed me, who greeted me to the university and made me feel at home. So. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Jarrett Lopez. I'm from Brandenburg, Kentucky, um, and I'm currently studying political science and history. Uh, history is my minor and political science is my major. Um, I visited NKU my sophomore year of high school. I was invited to the sophomore showcase, and I came and uh, wandered through campus and saw everyone and everything. And at the time, I didn't realize it, but Bonnie Meyer, who is the director of LGBTQ programs and services here, was a big influence on me because 
She has worked very hard with, I'm sure, a lot of you in this room to make this university an inclusive place. Um, and so that was reflected in me seeing the rainbow flag in her office um, and people tabling for um, uh, the annual drag show. And while that's more uh, an aesthetic thing, I was also really drawn to uh, the modernness of the campus and its situation in the shadow of Cincinnati. Hi, my name is Brittany Benson. Um, I'm 29 years old. I'm a local to Northern Kentucky. Um, I am a gateway to NKU transfer. Uh, I'm in the uh, social work program and I graduate next fall. Um, what drew me to NKU originally was the gateway to NKU pathway program, um, which was honestly just the, the major game changer. Um, there were other universities that I did consider, um, but the reason that I decided on NKU was um, it's very highly regarded at Gateway. Um, I was very active, uh, very actively involved at Gateway, and it was just spoken of very well uh, at Gateway, and um, particularly the social work program, um, and um, the PAC program as well, which is parents attending college, so I knew that I would have that support. Um, because I am a single mother, so there's a bit of a different dynamic. Uh, I'm not really the traditional college student, so that was important. And um, at the end of the day, NKU offered the, the best opportunity from, from what I could see. Great. So now you know a little bit about our, our panelists, and uh, we'll move on to uh, sharing some of uh, our experiences here, at, here as students. Um, so if you all would reflect on any experiences such as the admin, admission or application process, the orientation process, including registering for classes, seeking out various ways to get engaged and involved on campus, seeking help from your faculty mentor or academic advisor, balancing school, work, and other responsibilities, seeking help from student support services such as tutoring, UCAP, career advising, financial assistance. You don't have to reflect on all of these experiences <laughs> by any means, but we will popcorn around and um, you all can tackle uh, some of these experiences to um, which you feel best appropriately you can res respond to. So whoever would like to start us off. Um, I'll start. Um, so the application process, because I came from Gateway, on one hand it was a little bit confusing, but to be honest, um, I had a pretty good experience with it. I think that because my advisors at Gateway were so involved, as well as the advisors um, here at NKU were so involved from the day that I began, the day that I enrolled um, for the Gateway to NKU pathway. Um, I spoke with my advisor, originally it was Stacy Schaff and then uh, Dana, but um, so I mean, that, that process for me was, was pretty seamless. And then, um, uh, let's see, registering for classes, I sat down with my advisor, that was good. Um, somebody else wanna <laughs> jump in? Um, Something that I really have enjoyed uh, here at NKU is just the, uh, is how everyone here is willing to take on an advisory role, especially in my department. Um, with my scholarship, I go and meet with UCAP once a year now, um, and my uh, scholarship advisor has always been very helpful. Um, but also, aside from just my advisors in my department, which is political science, um, uh, the professors will take on a role. Uh, I've had immense help from uh, Dr. Shauna Riley, Dr. Salzman, and Professor uh, April Redden, just to name a few people who have been uh, uh, indisposable in my abilities to see as a student um, and those resources that they've offered for me. Um, I know for me, uh, the biggest thing that I looked for when I first came to school was that I wanted to make sure, like I said, I felt at home. And um, the one thing I didn't want to do is be one of those students that kind of stayed in and just stayed in my room. So I really wanted to be actively involved within not only the African American community, but the community as a whole um, here at Northern Kentucky University. And for me, my first step for that was joining uh, the ROCKS program as a freshman. 
Um, and then ever since then, I have been involved in the ROCKS program all the way up until this year. So I came in as a freshman, as a scholar. Uh, my sophomore year, I was uh, very fortunate enough to serve as a mentor. And then even this year, I was very much uh, fortunate enough to serve as a mentor. And I find it very <clears throat> important uh, in more ways just because I know for me, it means that I'm making a difference for somebody. And um, they look at me and they see, you know, I can be bigger than just a normal, than just a normal student. Um, I'm actively involved throughout, the, uh, throughout campus, uh, whether it is in African American programs and services or working uh, within the history department um, in Landrum. Um, I guess I'll kind of speak to balancing um, schoolwork and like the other responsibilities. Um, so when I came to NKU, I was involved in the ROCKS program as well. Um, back in 2012, seems like a long time ago. Um, but um, I came through as a student and they really helped kind of guide and introduce me to different um, different programs or different events going on campus or things to involve, um, things to get involved in. Um, from there, I became a mentor and I loved helping um, first generation students and all that come in and kind of guide them and help them as well. And so throughout my whole career at NKU, like seven years, I've been um, involved in um, working on campus. So while working in campus, I worked in the admissions office for from 2013 to up until I graduated undergrad. And so they were really a support system that kind of helped to guide me, um, introduced me to um, different people, helped me network and kind of let me um, I had the privilege of uh, kind of being kind of like a counselor, helping students uh, decide on embarking upon their journey at NKU. So I really love being able to go to schools and teach students about NKU and why they should come to NKU. So that's something I really love doing um, here and being able to get that opportunity to do that. Um, now that I am in law school, um, I had the pleasure of working in the African American Programs and Services Office. Um, so I was able to build that relationship with Rock Steel and be able to help mentor and teach those um, students coming to NKU how to um, retain um, being involved and working at the same time. So I really loved NKU that I've been able to have that privilege of being in school and working and having the different opportunities at the same time. Great, so you've heard a little bit about their experiences, their support systems, the different communities that they've been able to join during their time here. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask you all, what barriers have you faced that have created obstacles for um, persistence and completion? How did you resolve them? And then what advice would you give to other students in similar situations? Uh, I'll, start, I'll start this one. Um, so for me, uh, being here for three years, I've actually gone through a lot of trials and tribulations, whether it's been dealing with um, unfortunate passings within my family, um, taking care of both my mother and my father if they needed anything, or just taking care of, um, you know, helping things out with my brothers. Um, the one thing I would definitely say is that it has made me a much better student and a person, just because it's taught me that I can go through so many different trials and tribulations and I can still do very well. I can still maintain um, a strong GPA. I can still go to class and, you know, keep my head up, even though I feel like I'm down and, you know, the world is crashing around me. Um, I was still able to maintain and do very well. <clears throat> and then my advice for any students who are in similar situations is, um, really be transparent when it, when it comes to talking to your professors. That's the biggest thing that I learned is that if my professors knew what I was going through as a person, they were more willing to help me and, you know, make sure I was doing okay. I even had professors who would email me and, you know, just ask me if I'm doing okay. Ask me after class how I'm doing. You know, where's my head at, you know, and... Um, to me, that was kind of the biggest thing, was just knowing that my professor supported me and still made sure that I was going to, you know, be successful in their class, um, even though I was going through my own personal trials and tribulations. I'll kind of piggyback on that, the same thing. So when I transferred, um, I was a little terrified. <laughs> um, I have anxiety and um, just life sometimes can be a barrier especially whenever you have a lot going on. Um, and being a single mom and trying to, 
you know, be a good mom and then also maintain good grades. Um, I graduated from Gateway with honors and I was just so attached to just my whole family there. I mean, they became my family. So whenever I transferred, I was really nervous. Like, this is so much bigger and it's just gonna be so much different. Um, so my first day of class, I mean, I was just a nervous wreck. I knew that academically, I was totally prepared. I felt, I felt really good academically, but just because it was so much bigger, um, I was really nervous. And I remember my very first day of class, um, my, all my professors were just so nice and um, just very, uh, they're just full of information and I was like, oh my gosh, I just, it just made me feel so much better. Um, specifically, Dr. Amanda Brown, she's wonderful. Um, she, <laughs> I remember the very first day she's like, I see you guys and I can see the fear on your faces. I promise it's gonna be okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, to, to say the same, just for other students, being transparent with your teachers and um, just reaching out and getting involved I think makes a huge difference and then just the professors themselves make, make a huge difference. It can, it can be the difference between an awesome semester or a not so awesome semester. Um, so, so far I've had a, a great experience. And the social work program is, um, it's, it's, we, we're in cohorts, so I think that, that that's helpful as well. Um, but yeah, just the, the same kind of being transparent and, and reaching out when you need help. Um, for me, uh, I'm a first generation college student, so I don't have that, uh, foundation of knowledge to like lean back on my family and be like, how did you get through this? Um, I mean, they're supportive. They're like, keep, keep up the good work, Jarrett. But other than that, <laughs> I can't be like, how did you get through this? And so I've really leaned on uh, the offices here. Um, my first year, I had to meet with UCAP once a semester and uh, she made sure I stayed on a, on a good path. Um, but since then, and since uh, getting more involved on campus and uh, starting to take more three and 400 level classes, it's really, uh, it's really easy to feel overloaded and overworked. Um, and being able to uh, balance that has been a struggle at some points. Uh, uh, but to get through that, I have had to just prioritize, um, even if it means uh, staying up late to write a paper and then studying for an exam the next morning or something like that. Um, that's what I've had to do as a student at some points. Um, Luckily, my major is paper heavy, so I don't have too many like in-class exams, but uh, that's definitely something that I've faced is that feeling of uh, all of these things piling up and just how to sort through them. And um, I've definitely had help on campus through the different offices. Yeah, so transitioning, uh, Jared brought up a great point, um, this help through offices on campus. So what programs and services have been your strongest support systems? Um, so I kind of mentioned this, but um, the programs and services that kind of have helped me through my whole career is um, the African American Programs and Services Office, the Admissions Office, um, and then individual people like Rochelle Shields, Danny Moore, Melissa Gorban, um, Kim, um, just all have kind of been there to kind of let me know, hey, how are you doing? Do you need anything? And I think that really helps as a student when you're going through um, college and you have to handle this plus work and everything else, just knowing that there's someone here besides your parents, just making sure that you're on top of things and okay. Um, she really took the words right out of my mouth on that one. <laughs> literally took the words right out of my mouth. Um, for me, is the is very similar. Um, African American Programs and Services has always been one of my biggest backbones since I've been um, here at the university. The ROCKS program has been a big one. Um, UCAP office, I don't know where I'd be without them. Um, TRIO office is another big one. Um, it's just, like she said, it's knowing that I have a strong support system as a, as a student. And then, you know, even more so as a minority student, um, I do have that support um, that make sure, that they make sure I'm okay. Um, but they also, they're very, they're very adamant in making sure, you know, not only am I personally okay, but, you know, how are my classes? What am I struggling in? How can I get help? If I'm struggling in math, 
you know, who can I go to? Well, what tutoring do I need? What other resources do I need? If I need help with a book, you know, who, where can I go to find it? Um, they're very adamant in making sure that as a minority student, um, I'm taken care of, and whether it's in school or whether it's um, in my personal life. Um, uh, I've sort of talked about the two offices that have helped me the most, um, the Office of LGBTQ Programs and Services and UCAP. Um, I got involved with the Office of LGBTQ Programs and Services my second year here at the university. Um, and aside from giving me responsibilities, which made me feel more attached um, here at the university, um, they also gave me a quiet place to work, um, uh, words of encouragement, uh, checking in on me, uh, like uh, sitting in uh, Ray Loftus's office, like, how are your classes going? What are you working on? Um, how can I help? Um, that's been very beneficial for me um, as a student. Yeah. <laughs> um, other than my advisors and my professors, I would say uh, PAC, Parents Attending College, um, that one's been big, and then TRIO Project Aspire, which we had at Gateway as well, and it kind of helped me to transfer, um, it tra you know, helped me to transfer over. So the fact that the program was at both colleges was uh, really reassuring to me as well. I think it's pretty clear that we have an incredible community here and, and incredible support systems for our students. If you could change one thing about your peers' experience here, what would it be and why? <laughs> um, I would say for me, um, so this will probably be my third time reiterating this, but coming through the ROCKS program, the one thing they tell us is that um, the person you are sitting next to might not be here that next semester. Um, so for me, that's kind of the, my big thing when it comes to my peers is that I can count on my hand how many uh, African American men are still in school from, from when I came into college in 2016, or in the fall of 2016. And so to me, I think that um, speaks more about how I wish my peers' experience went. Um, just because whether it was, you know, they went through their own personal battles or they thought school wasn't for them, I just wish, um, you know, I could have been there a little bit more so that, that way it's like you're, they're still in school, they don't regret leaving school. Um, that's kind of my big thing. I just wish you know, more of my peers were still, were still here with me you know, to see uh, junior year. And then for me personally, uh, I'm, on, I'm on the cusp of senior year. I'll be a senior in the spring um, and I'll be graduating in the fall of 2019. So um, that's just kind of my biggest thing. I'll go. <laughs> Um, a, lot of, a lot of the experiences that I've seen among my peers is um, struggling financially to figure out how they're going to pay for, for another semester at their university so they can pursue their goals, they can pursue their major. Um, a lot of these people, they're probably, a lot of my peers who I've personally had conversations with of them not being able to continue here, um, they've been first generation students as well who have uh, maybe not done as well um, academically, so they didn't get the same opportunities that were awarded to me as a student. Um, and so their financial ability to stay in the university was, uh, they couldn't. Um, and so they've had to return home. I think I, I've had about five friends return home, at least three to my home county. Um, and so that's, an, that's one thing. And then another is um, there's, no, the university empties out at about four o'clock, usually, most days. There's not much of a, uh, like a residential culture. Um, uh, commuters leave, um, and so they don't feel as connected to the university um, through that. And I think, and I don't know how the university could rectify that, but it's something to think about. I mean, I feel like we have a lot of great support programs um, and a lot of good systems. The only thing that I could speak to probably is the financial aspect as well. Um, 
For example, on Thursday, one of my classmates, he thought we had a test, so he, he made it to class. He made sure that he was there. And then he's like, I have to go because I can't pay for a full days of parking. So um, he ended up leaving class early because he couldn't pay for a full day of parking, which I'm, I mean, I don't know how we, how we navigate that, how we go about that, um, but you know, that, that is, I know, one, one of the issues that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of my classmates have struggled with, I mean, myself included. Um, I would say the biggest thing for me with my peers is um, speaking up and reaching out to people and asking for help. I think a lot of us forget that we can't ask for help or see that as a weakness. And I notice that a lot with a lot of my peers. So I think the biggest um, change for the student-wise would be speaking up and kind of letting people know that you need help or what you're not understanding because that builds kind of that connection where the um, communication kind of drips off and that's when I kind of see students start to fall off or not um, come back to school for those reasons. Great, so we just talked a little bit about what we could do to help change uh, possibly one's peers experience here at NKU. So my next question is, um, is there one thing that NKU could do to change or differently to do differently to enhance your experience and um, if you have anything, what would that be and why? And I think I might be able to start this one off a little bit as a student. Um, this, is a, this is a hard question. And, and I really actually commend, you know, this group up here on, on, state, on stage being so vulnerable with you. It's not easy to sit up here in front of a bunch of administrators and, and tell you all the, the problems that we face as students because it's, it's very different. Um, I could say that um, financial aid for, for myself individually has been a difficult process. Travis and financial aid, I think he and I have become best friends uh, <laughs> the number of times I've been in his seat. Um, I think what we could do is maybe give that office a little more help. Um, I feel like that is, a, that is an office that is overwhelmed uh, oftentimes. Um, even the Students' Rights and Advocacy Office, I know we're in the process of getting a new uh, coordinator, but um, we've got offices on campus that are overwhelmed, and because they're overwhelmed, they're not able to, to do their jobs, and, and that's to make sure that students are succeeding. So with that, if um, you all have any commentary to add on. How, you wanna go? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, financial aid has been one of my struggles. Um, communication it, during the busy, the very busy season, which, you know, is the beginning of the semester, and uh, yeah, I mean, the, the same, the same kind of issue. I don't, I don't think that it's, they're just so, they're just so overwhelmed, um, which you get an email saying, hey, we're very busy right now, we're doing the best we can to uh, take care of things, we'll get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, but sometimes it's a long time. So, and then, you know, as a student, whenever you're trying to navigate, okay, well, I have my tuition bill due on this day, I need to know, like, as soon as possible, because I need to know, do I, do I need to take out student loans? Because I don't want to be dinged that fee, right? Because if I don't know what's going on with my financial aid, then there's, you know, it creates an issue. So, yeah, I mean, same I would agree with that too. Um, financial aid has been the biggest challenge for me, um, trying to figure out how to budget, what I'm getting, scholarships and all of that while balancing school. And I would say it's even, it's gotten kind of worse for me being in grad school and law school, um, knowing that I can't work as much. So trying to be able to find the time to meet with financial aid in between classes as well as figuring, figuring out how am I going to manage that while going to school with limited hours to work and all that has just really been very stressful um, to deal with on top of law school. So I would say that was, that's the biggest challenge for me. Okay. Any other possible challenges? All right. 
Well, we'll move, we'll move on to our, our next question. Um, obviously, it's our 50th anniversary, and we have a lot to be, a lot to be proud of here. We've got uh, very special faculty and students that are here, and, and I'm just so excited to see all the things and all the special events that we host. But um, what aspirations do you have for NKU as we head into our next 50 years? I think, I think just growth, to be honest. Um, I think that we're doing great <laughs> right now so far, but I mean, I'm still new, so maybe ask me whenever I graduate from the B my BSW program next fall. Um, but no, I mean, I would say growth, uh, more diversity. I'm not really sure how we navigate that as well. I think that we're, uh, we are doing pretty well with diversity. I don't know the numbers, but uh, I know just in my particular classes, there are, are so many different people from all different walks of life. And as a student, I think that that's really important because I'm learning from you, right? I'm, I'm not only learning from my professors, but I'm learning from my classmates because you've experienced things that I've never experienced and I've experienced things that you've never experienced. So um, especially in the field of social work, that's, I mean, that's just so key for me to be able to learn that. So I think that diversity is, is super important um, I don't know how we, I, mean, I don't think that it necessarily needs to be changed or do different, you know, do anything differently, but um, just continue to kind of focus on that. Um, yeah. Um, for me, I uh, definitely growth. I'd love to come back to NKU in 50 years and see that we have 30,000 students. That'd be amazing. Um, <laughs> uh, but more, um, I'd love to see more diversity in curriculum itself. Um, some of my favorite classes I've taken have been special topics classes where, where faculty members have the room to create the curriculum as they want and uh, focus on the things that they want and uh, really tailor it to the student, uh, what the students want from the course. And I think uh, expanding those special topics, making those standard, more standard to where there's more than just say one or two offered by a department, there are like three or four. Um, but that would be attached to hiring more faculty because I've heard from uh, many students that uh, they feel that their professors are being stretched thin. Um, and so not only would I love to see NKU have 30,000 students, but a lot of faculty in each department as well in the next 50 years. Um, for me, uh, the big thing that I would like to see. I guess it's just, um, like they were saying, growth within the university and diversity. Um, you know, I come from a family where I've had two uh, Northern Kentucky graduates come, come here. Um, and the one thing they always tell me is that they see how the university has, has grown from the time they graduated in 2002, from 2009 to 2016. They just see how the university has grown. Um, and I think that's just kind of my biggest thing, you know, in the next 50 years. I want to see, you know, the university that I love keep growing and uh, keep expanding. I agree. I would say diversity um, with the student body as well as with the faculty and staff. Um, when I first came here in, in 2012, um, I was in the political science department. And so I was really the only one of color and female um, in most of my classes. And by the time I graduated, well, got to my last year, I kind of noticed that change. And so there were more people of color in my class. And I really liked that, um, being able to get different perspectives and everyone be able, being able to feed off of each other. And I do notice that within the um, years that I've been here. So I really like that. And I'd like to answer this question too. I think there's nothing more special than seeing faculty members collaborate with their students. I was able to sit down and have a conversation with the new Dean of the Honors, uh, Jim Buss, and, and he was talking to me about all these crazy things, all, all these crazy things that I, I never thought I was capable of doing. Um, even being in this position, he was telling me about these scholarships, about these research opportunities, and I, and I started getting really excited. I was like, oh my goodness, I can do research here. I can work with the faculty one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe I can have something published by the time that I graduate. Um, just all these, all these thoughts and, all, and there's, there's this passion that's growing. And when we start to create that with our faculty members and our students, we get something really special. And I think that we can, we can move forward with those passions. Um, and not only just, just working with 
with students, but how can faculty work with administrators and how can faculty work with staff um, with these interdisciplinary things that we're all so passionate about? And what can we do to, you know, ignite this North story moving in the next 50 years? And so I think this is a really special place to, to be and I think we've got great things going on here. But with all that being said, I think we're gonna now transition into lunch. Um, stay, stay, stay by and talk to some of our students, ask them some more questions. Yeah, maybe a few minutes for questions from the audience. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> no one's hungry. <laughs> sure, so at this time we can uh, transition into taking questions from the audience. I think I saw uh, Dr. Padgett. So Jared. So, Jarrett, you shared that you were first generation, and I don't know if there were any other first generation students on the panel, uh, but I'd like to ask the panel, um, how can NKU best support first generation students as they transition into the school, as well as transition all the way through to graduation? Um, I know the biggest resource uh, that I turned to um, was definitely UCAP, um, but there are so many things that I didn't, like, I didn't know that I didn't know about college <laughs> um, until I got here, um, and just making sure that um, there's someone who is checking in with first generation students, like, how are you doing? Um, how are your classes? Um, are, you, are you stressed? <laughs> how stressed are you, and is it manageable? I think it's definitely something um, that students need, um, just in general, but definitely with first generation students as well. I think for me the biggest thing is support. Um, a lot of for, uh, first generation students, um, especially since some of my friends are first gen, um, you see how they struggle. Um, and then they don't have that, um, it's like Jared said, they don't have that support back at home or parents might not know exactly what's going on or how financial aid works or how classes work, credit hours. Um, so I think the biggest thing for first gen is just, you know, making sure that they're, that they're being supported. Um, so I was first generation to law school, and so I kind of wish there was more of sessions or programs or um, different things to kind of help guide me because I was terrified. Um, how do I apply? What to do? Um, what do I go through to um, get into the university um, through law school and all that? So it was just very overwhelming, and I really had no one in my family to kind of reach out to and help that. Um, so I did end up sitting in Ashley Gray's office a lot, like almost every week I was in there. Am I doing this right? Uh, what do I need here? How do I apply for this? And all these different questions I had that I had no answers um, to really on my own. So if there was just more of programming um, that kind of geared towards helping students make that transition from, to, from undergrad to grad school. I was actually a first generation student too and the faculty member that really played a, a difference in my life was April Redden. I mean this woman, she emailed me like once a week. She was like, how are you doing? Is financial aid okay? I mean, to this day, this woman will email me all sorts of things. I'm like, April, I'm three years, girl. I've got this down pat now. She's like, no, no, I'm here for you anytime. And I think it really took that relationship and that commitment um, from a faculty member to make me realize that, um, you know, the faculty here are really different than just anywhere else. And, and it's April and it's people like April that make a difference in the lives of students here. Any more questions? Yes. What does so, student success mean to you? Yes, so the question was, what does student success mean to you? I, I think for me personally, um, as a mom and as a single mom, uh, I think it's just my daughter seeing me uh, get good grades in school and seeing me graduate. When, when she got to see me walk across that stage, um, actually it was here, but for Gateway's graduation, I graduated with my, uh, with honors, um, with my, my uh, associate in applied science of human services. And uh, just the fact that she, she was there and she was clapping and she's, yeah, yay, mommy. You know, seeing me walk, walk across that stage with my honors course, that, that's, that's success to me. Uh, for me, I've measured my success uh, not only with my GPA, which I'm very proud of, 
Um, <laughs> but also in the stuff and the things that I've done, I've had the opportunity to conduct uh, personal research that I've been able to present at conference, a conference. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to conduct cl uh, collaborative research with a professor. Um, and to me, that's, that's taking the extra step as a student and I, being successful is, um, is uh, achieving high things academically, but also doing things and expanding outside of the classroom. I think research is amazing and that every student should do research or some sort of creative activity in their field. And I, th I, think, that's the, I think that's how I define my success. Um, for me, I define mine really, um, one comes from my family. Um, so I have two, um, I have two nephews and a niece who uh, look up to me as if I'm just Superman. Now, I mean, you're laughing, but it, it's, real, it's really uh, heartwarming to me to know that uh, those three look at me and they're like, wow, they were there when I graduated from high school. Uh, I graduated from high school with honors. Um, and they were like, that, that's my uncle. He's doing, he's doing amazing things. They were in this very same ballroom uh, when I first came to Ujima, you know, to receive my, my scholarship. Uh, they've been here every step of the way. And then another thing for my student success is just the connections I make. Um, I look around this room and I, really, I never realized actually how many um, administration I'm, I know in this room um, and, who, and, who know, and who know me. Um, and that's, that's just big for me. I, lo I love connections with people. I love people. Um, and to me, I define my student success as being that student who um, it's not braggadocious, but I like being able to say, you know, I know uh, such and such. I know this person. Um, but it also brings me joy that they know me and they can speak very good on my name. Um, so, yeah. um, to me, success stems to one word, and I usually use confidence for that. Um, being able to be confident in anything that I do, um, whether it be as a student or a worker or just in the community, is something that I um, believe is success. And for me, I think it's about having a, a well-rounded experience, not only inside the classroom, but outside the classroom. Um, it's about taking what you learn in your classroom and, and, and then participating in an internship and, and using those concepts and, and theories that, that you learned in the classroom and saying, how do I apply that in the real world? Um, and I think um, so often we get caught up in um, maybe just the content and, and we, we fail to sometimes uh, transition in how to apply that. Um, and I think that's something that we can continue to grow and work on is uh, creating those experiences outside the classroom to apply what we're already doing. Okay, we let have me, one final question. Okay. Right, <laughs> Mr. President. Let, let, me, um, let me ask a question. I was fascinating to hear the responses about student success and um, I'm, I'm curious about the notion of of your, uh, how, how well prepared do you feel uh, the NKU experience has been, depending on where you are? Of course, I know, Brittany, you're, you're just starting your, uh, the second, the two plus two program, but how well prepared do you think you are for career success? How well do you think NKU has done? Um, you mentioned confidence, you mentioned looking up, all, all of which is really great, but we're also mindful of the fact that, you know, that's one of the, one of the criteria that Maybe you set out for yourselves. Tell us a little bit about, about how well you feel uh, we have prepared you for career success. Um, I would say amazingly. Um, I feel very prepared. Um, like I said, I was able to work while going to class, um, classes, so I had that experience of being able to network with different um, programs on campus or different offices, as well as get out into the community and kind of get that experience, like she was saying, from what you learn in the classroom and kind of apply that to outside of the classroom. And I think NKU has prepared me well through, for that through undergrad and grad school. Um, while in grad school, I'm able to apply what I'm learning in law school to, I'm working with the Ohio Justice and Policy Center. So being able to take those different opportunities that NKU offers to the different clinics at the law school, I think is amazing that I'm able to get that opportunity while still in school. Uh, for me, I feel very prepared. Um, as a history major, the biggest thing that uh, 
the one thing that we always learn is that you have to be able to articulate, write, and um, express your opinion while giving fact. Um, and for me, that's, that's just my biggest thing that I take into every history class. And I also love the fact that um, me being prepared for, the, for my next step, which uh, is law school, is the fact that my, profess my professors have genuinely taken the time out to make sure I am prepared. You know, anything that I do not know, any questions that I have, uh, they make sure that they get answered. You know, if, I'm, if I ask them, you know, I don't exactly know um, how to do this or I don't know exactly know how to write this in a specific way, they will take the time out to help me. And a lot of that, I still believe it's because, you know, it's just the class size. You know, I love being able, I love my professors knowing my name, knowing my aspirations and knowing what I want to do um, in my life. And I think it make, I think it allows them to invest more in me. Um, but me personally, Y'all have done a really good job in preparing us. Uh, yeah, I echo that I feel very prepared. Um, I've uh, not only conducted personal research, I've, uh, I'm now conducting collaborative research. I've interned in Frankfurt with Senator Will Schroeder. I feel prepared to take my next steps, next steps whether it's to graduate school or into the political science field uh, or the governmental field in whatever form that takes uh, within the next two years. I, I know that I am still new, but um, I know the path of what I have to do for my bachelor's as well as my master's. And um, even, even now, in all of my classes, they've said to me, hey, we're doing this because not only is this going to be something that you're going to encounter whenever you are out in the work field, but also this is going to be like on the licensure exam. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's really important to me. Um, but I, I know for my major, um, we're required. We have you know, an internship that is a few hundred hours. So I, I feel like after that, I should be prepared. If I'm not, it's probably my fault. <laughs> and I feel prepared as well. I, and I know that I couldn't have done it without uh, members of this community in this room and even outside of this room. My sorority has given me the confidence to to move mountains. Um, anytime I'm nervous about something, I have four or five of them in the audience ready to cheer me on. Um, faculty members, anytime that I need, uh, I have questions about everything. I, I'm, I always am in their inbox and they always are so prompt to get back to me with whatever I need. Um, you know, reaching out to administrators across campus and saying, you know, I have a concern about this, and them taking the time to say, hey, let's get together and schedule an appointment to, to talk about whatever you need. All those things and, and all those different communities and experiences have made me feel confident, and, and I love how you talked about that because I think leaving NKU, students are more confident than when they came because of not only what they're learning in the classroom, but their experiences and the communities that we're creating here. Okay, we're very, very lucky. Uh, certainly one of the things I always brag to my colleagues about is how fortunate I feel working with such outstanding, highly committed and talented individuals who really want to make a difference inside the classroom and outside. So would you join me in thanking them for being a panel? So the, you know, we have, we have talked about student success all the time, but you know, what was cool is sitting here and looking, turning backward to see everyone smiling as the students give their answers and tell their stories. So you talk, you know, how do we define student success? It's these five students here. So now it'll be our job to figure out how to distill what they've told us and keep it on our minds for the next six months, six years, whatever. Um, but fortunately, we've, you know, the, the College of Informatics has helped us to design some contact lenses so that if you blink twice, the video from this panel will appear in your eyes so you can sort of be re-inspired all over again. That, that we're not doing that, by the way, but that's like the type of thing that we should aspire to do. So thank you all for, for serving as a good inspiration for us.